use uh, Jonathan. This is Jonathan. You've been a Holacracy One coach, partner, uh, developer. All you've those things. All this yep. stuff, right? You've used it in Silicon Valley. You've done, gone all over the Netherlands and used this. Yep. So you've got loads of experiences you're going to share with us tonight. Yeah. I'm really excited for it. Yeah, and I'm excited to share. Okay. Cool. So this is the first time I've done this presentation. Um, I haven't been gone all the way through it in front of people, so it might be a little rocky. Um, and just real quick before we get started, I'm going to start us off with a quick check-in round. So I'm going to say my name and what company I'm with and like what my role is, um, and that's about it. So I'm Jonathan. I'm a consultant, and uh, I'm here to present on Holacracy. Would you like to give me your name and? Uh, what, kind of what you're up to, real briefly? Yes, I'm Conrad, um, friend of my own company, independent consultant, and um, all agile, agile related uh, stuff. Jeff Lasky, senior agile coach with Q Mutual. Sweet. I'm Derek Mimbeck, and I'm also a consultant. Sweet. I'm Doug Knessick, I'm the director of agile development at uh, Flexion. Cool. I'm Jeff Gould, I'm an agile coach at Q Mutual, that's of my own company, Made Consulting. Coaching and training on the side. I'm Paul Sager. I'm actually a speed right now. Cool. I'm Jack Kowalski. I'm a scrum master at Team Mutual. I'm Calvera. I'm a medicine. I'm a practice director of modern technology there. Alpha Kama. I'm an MPP8. Angie Williams, a healthcare consultant. Lee Hamilton is a healthcare consultant. So. Selena Schmidt. I'm a contractor, but I'm a scrum master at WPS. Great. Chad Byer, organizational ability advisor for the company, whiteboardconsulting.org. Sweet. You guys did that really well. So we just did a check-in round. This is one of the uh, fundamental practices in Holacracy, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, I like check-in rounds a lot. I think it helps break the ice and relax people. We didn't really do it super formally. This probably would have taken about 10 minutes if we would have actually shared how we're doing and anything on our mind and what we need to do to get present. Um, but hey, it helps me get a little more comfortable up here in front of you. So. <laughs> We'll take it. So the title of the talk is Holacracy, agility, Structural Agility at All Levels. Uh, I'm Jonathan Yankovich. My email is j at teal.dog. This is a new project I'm launching for uh, assisting with self-management. Um, but feel free to drop me an email. I love talking about this stuff. Um, always happy to talk about it. So let me check my notes here. Um, I'm a Madison native. I spent the last eight years in the Bay Area and spent the last four working at Holacracy One, which is the company that has been pioneering Holacracy in the world. Um, most of my background is in uh, software development. Um, I worked in the glass frog circle at H1. And um, I'm now sort of a recovering developer. I don't want to do development work anymore. Um, I still do it for myself and for fun. Teal Dog is a personal project. Um, but I really find that I can do a lot more good working with people than with computers. Um, so uh, at Holacracy One, I was a developer. Uh, our scrum master role, which we called Agilator, something a little different. And uh, I'm also a Holacracy facilitator and a certified Holacracy coach. Um, and yeah, today I consider myself a recovering software developer. And uh, I articulate my purpose as I help people work better together. That's what I'm up to now. Um, so anything I can do to further that purpose, I'm into it. And I would love to work with you on that, on that mission. Um, and I feel that I give people the freedom to be themselves at work uh, as much as possible. And uh, that's one of the things that Holacracy has helped me do and helped me see as, as available. Um, I feel, the, feel like the best work feels like play. Like when I'm at my best, it just feels like I'm being creative and playful and young. And like that's the experience that, that I want us to have. Uh, so Holacracy has changed my life, or rather it's shown me ways of being that have changed me as a result. Uh, so I live out in the country, out in Oregon, Wisconsin. This is an art studio my mom built, and we live out there. Uh, we have workshops and stuff, and she does art in there, and it's beautiful. I also run a small YouTube channel where I talk about this kind of stuff. Um, and this, this talk will probably go up there with any luck. And uh, if you have any questions after the talk, if I can't answer them now, I'll answer them on YouTube. So please, if you got them, write them down, bring them up. I would love to, I would love to get that stuff and, and, and get that out there. Um, that's basically me right now. Uh, quick disclaimer. Um, I know my peers are going to watch this, my colleagues. Uh, this is not meant to be exhaustive or complete. Uh, Holacracy is a big space. Uh, I'm going to make some simplifications and generalizations uh, in the interest of, of learning. I'm also not a business person. I don't have any business management theory. 
Um, I just know how to build things, I know how to work with people, and I'm one of the 25 or so people in the world that are lucky enough to have worked with this technology this closely. And I'm super excited to share it with you. So the title is Holacracy, Structural Agility at All Levels. And Holacracy is a big topic, there's lots of nuance and detail. It has structural aspects, it has process-oriented aspects, behavioral aspects, and its fair share of jargon. Probably reminds you of Agile. Um, and as we go through this, I would encourage you to be skeptical and be curious. Uh, this system didn't get to be where it is by people just taking it, taking it on and, go, and going with it. It's been refined, it's been challenged. Uh, it's not easy. Um, it's uncomfortable to, to, like, to learn to use it. It's, it's really, it's really I, I like to think of it kind of as, Holacracy as an organizational management system is kind of where software was about 20 years ago. Like, you can do cool stuff with software, but man, usability. So um, that's kind of where, where Holacracy is at. It can do some amazing stuff, and it's kind of clunky. And so we're working on ways to make it more learnable, more accessible. Um, and we'll probably find out more about that. Um, and if you do write down any questions, the slide numbers are in the corner. If you want to write down a, the slide number, you're welcome to do that, and that'll help me queue up which questions go with which slides so I can improve this in the future. Um, so before we dive in, uh, how many, for how many people is this like your first exposure to Holacracy? Like you hadn't even, haven't even heard of it before this. Okay, about half the room, wow, cool. And uh, if you've like uh, had a conversation about Holacracy or maybe read the book, who's in that camp? Okay, cool. And is anyone actually practicing self-management or distributed authority in their organizations or their clubs? Yeah, awesome. Um, so you can see that the, 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 the distribution dot there went down quickly. Um, distributed management is still kind of a new thing, uh, which is part of what makes it so exciting. Um, let's see, so drawing on some comparisons. Why is there a need for holacracy? Well, why is there a need for Agile? Wasn't Waterfall doing good enough? Um, oh, it was the changing requirements. It was that things are moving too quickly now for us to plan ahead all the work and then do the work. The same thing is true in business now. Uh, and that's why Holacracy is, is up and coming. Um, we need to be able to steer dynamically. And there's, just, there's too much complexity to design up front. Software noticed this first because software is so complex. And business is getting more and more complex. The world of atoms is getting more and more complex. Um, and so more and more, uh, something like Holacracy is becoming, I think, more and more uh, apt and more, more and more usable. Um, Agile came out of necessity. But it was necessary to develop a better way to do this. The projects were taking too long. They still take too long. But, um, but it, it, Agile was born of necessity. And I think it's the same thing with Holacracy. It's just so, still so early that um, it can feel a little, uh, well, probably a little reckless, kind of like when Agile, Agile first came around, right? Like, no schedule, what small work, and we're going to have a conversation about what we build? Like, all of these kinds of things uh, are going to take some time to seep into, into our large organizational culture. Um, so Holacracy has generalized a lot of concepts from Agile, and I think you'll see a lot of, a lot of overlap. And it's also taken inspiration from uh, various other places. Uh, before we jump into what Holacracy is, let's talk about what Holacracy is not. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, Holacracy is not a management theory. It wasn't born out of theory. It was, it's all been created by practice, people on the ground doing work, seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, a man named Brian Robertson founded Holacracy One and started working on Holacracy at his company called Ternary Software where he's been refining it over the years. And eventually he shut down Ternary and he started on Holacracy One full time. Um, but he's not a management theorist either. Uh, he's, a, he's a builder, he's an entrepreneur. Um, and so you won't see a lot of charts or numbers. You'll just see a lot of practices and things that work and ways to change them, because that's what it's all about. Um, it's also not a new meeting format. A lot of people hear Holacracy and they're like, oh, the meetings, right? All the governance meetings, the tactical meetings? Yes, those things. But it goes way beyond that. When you're really doing Holacracy, it's a power shift. It changes the way authority works. It changes your relationship to power. Um, and that's a tall order to adopt all at once, and I'm not proposing that every company do that overnight. Um, but I, just, I don't want people to walk away thinking like, oh, cool, tactical meetings, great, that's Holacracy. You're not doing Holacracy if you're just doing the meetings. 
though I do encourage you to do at least one of the meeting formats that we'll talk about. It's also not democratic. Um, I was working with a client in the Bay Area, and one of the guys was really excited. He's like, okay, cool. When do we get to do the elections? Because I really, I, like, really want to do the elections, and like, it's, it's, it's a democracy, right? No, actually, it's not. It's highly structured. Um, and this particular guy, he wanted to have his influence in the organization in roles that he wasn't involved with. Maybe you have the experience of being in meetings with people who are kind of always putting in their two cents, or maybe it's a leader that's like offering more than is, is kind of in their wheelhouse or in their expertise. Holacracy can help you get clear by knowing who has what roles and what accountabilities and how they relate to each other. And it can shut down a lot of that kind of um, a lot of that conversation that, that goes on and on, or where uh, you're trying to seek consensus, that kind of thing. This guy, he was um, a little disheartened to find out that now we're actually more clear about who makes decisions, and it's, uh, more, it's, it's more decisions are made faster with less discussion as a result. Uh, it's also not flat. Anyone who says it's flat organization, no, it's incredibly structured, it's incredibly I would almost use the word hierarchical, and you'll, you'll see how that is in a minute. Um, and there are key shifts that make it very, very different. Um, but if you're thinking, oh, Holacracy, that's the flat management thing, no. No, it's not. There are specific people that have specific decision-making capabilities, and everybody is really clear about what those are, which is just a wonderful environment to work in. Um, so what it really boils down to is clarity. Um, Yeah, a lot of the time we spend time in meetings trying to get buy-in, trying to get consensus, and all that disappears when you have real organizational clarity. When you're clear about what you can do and what you can't do, then you're actually free. In this environment where it's, oh, we have unlimited vacation, or you can, you know, you can do whatever you want, go and just do, do the work, that's not real freedom. Freedom is when you know your limits. Um, it's much like being a member of a free society. You know, we're free in America, and there are there are laws and rules that we agree to abide by. Uh, that's where the freedom comes from, not from anarchy. Um, and clarity is how we get there. So we'll talk about more a bit more about the rules in a minute. Um, the practice aspect of holacracy is where it gets interesting and where it requires a lot of uh, self awareness and self reflection. And in this way, I think Holacracy is personally transformative as well as organizationally transformative. Um, but that's a topic for another talk. Um, so we just talked about how Holacracy is a set of rules and also a practice. Let's talk about the set of rules. Um, or a little bit about the influence of where, kind of where Holacracy came from. Holacracy has its origins in uh, biology, biomimicry, uh, sociocracy, which is a system for uh, distributed management, Agile software development, which is why I'm here today, and many other, other areas. It's, uh, I really can't do it justice. Brian Robertson can, can definitely do a better job on this topic than I can, but um, Holacracy takes influence from a number of places, and yet it wasn't really designed. It was the answer to a, it was the answer to a challenge to a question. It was something that was evolved. Can you quickly summarize what sociocracy? Yeah, soci so the question was, uh, what is sociocracy? Uh, sociocracy is a distributed uh, authority system um, that is different in, it, it's different from holacracy in that it's less structured. Uh, it's more consensus oriented as I understand it. I'm definitely, I'm definitely not an expert in sociocracy. So any sociocracy people out there, I apologize, I can't do it justice. Um, but it's, it's, sociocracy is one of the most popular uh, um, non-hierarchical distributed management systems out there besides holacracy. So Wikipedia actually does a pretty good job of explaining what holacracy is. Um, a lot of times I'm scared of Wikipedia's definitions, but I like this one. It says that holacracy is a decentralized management and organizational governance system in which authority and decision making are distributed throughout a hallarchy of self-organizing teams rather than being vested in a management hierarchy. Well, that's fairly interesting. Let's see if we can break it down a little bit. Um, the name, holacracy. Uh, holon, hola comes from holon, which is uh, a Greek word for something that is both uh, whole and simultaneously part of something else. And then ocracy, uh, which 
according to the definition, is government by a particular sort of people or according to a particular principle. Um, let's take a second to unpack that. A lot of people talk about new forms of, uh, new ways to manage businesses, a lot about having the right people and have the right values. And if we just get the right people and they're all aligned with the right value system, then we're, then we're good, right? And there's value in that for sure. Holacracy doesn't require that. Holacracy doesn't have any values. Um, it's a structural system. It's rules for how to play a game together. And you can play the game however you want and you can feel however you want while playing it. You don't have to subscribe to a specific belief system or uh, you know, get behind everyone when it comes to rallying around some particular thing that you value or somebody, somebody says you should value. Uh, and that's kind of why I like it is that you, you do get people of a certain type together. Um, I mean, pe birds of a feather kind of flock together, but there's also a lot of difference, a lot of diversity, a lot of dissent, uh, and that's part of what makes it so resilient. Okay, so to, to illustrate the first part, something that is simultaneously a whole and a part. This slide is out of order. Um, what, uh, what, what we're illustrating here is that both Agile, Agile Scrum and Holacracy share the concept of a role. Um, this is the, kind of our first commonality. However, in Holacracy, the roles are dynamic. They change and they're different in each circle, which we'll get to in a sec. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know a whole lot about the origins of Agile, but I, I think that those, those roles were created out of specific needs and, um, and it's the same thing in Holacracy. It's just that as a role filler, you have the authority to change that role to the environment. So we have dynamic roles as opposed to static roles. Um, so talking about something that is simultaneously whole and apart, um, the basic organizational unit in Holacracy is called a circle. It's composed of roles. And you can think of a circle as a team with some subtle differences. Um, each circle is a separate, fully autonomous entity and at the same time, it's part of a larger whole. Um, this has the effect of scoping the amount of sort of organizational surface area that you're exposed to at a given time. Um, if you're working in, if you're, if, let's say you're working in this circle and you're talking to these two circles, you don't need to know anything about the inner operations of this circle. These roles are completely opaque to you. They're, it's as opaque as me talking directly to your heart or your lungs. I don't do that, it's, it's inside of a membrane. Those roles are inside of a membrane. They're free to do their work the best way they, they see how. Um, and work comes into the circle through the membrane. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that pretty soon. Um, Can you contrast that with any other hierarchical functional organization where functions are encapsulated departments, teams of individuals? Sure. Sure, so the, other, the question was um, uh, contrast that with any kind of other, con any other conventional organizational system where teams are encapsulated. If there's rules around that encapsulation, I imagine it's quite similar. Um, but in this environment, if you're, let's say you're the boss of this outer circle, you have no authority to tell these people how to do their job. And depending on the rules of the organization, you might not have authority to, uh, to fire them. Um, so the, it's not a matter of anybody who's higher up has complete control, right? Which, might, which is like kind of traditionally how it goes. Um, this has a psychological effect of making you feel really safe. Like, this is my job. I know how to do it. I know how to work with these people. No one's gonna come in from the outside and change it or reorganize it, right? I, we, we organize it every week. We have a governance meeting and we change the structure that, that we work by. Um, so the, the circle membrane, as it's often called, is really a fairly um, carefully respected thing and something that, we're, that people are conscious of. Um, another example is uh, within the circle, people can request projects of each other and they, are, they, have an, they have a duty to prioritize those project requests. But if somebody from outside the circle makes a request of somebody inside, they can make a request of the circle as a whole and the, and the circle as a whole has a duty to respond to that request. But the people inside the, the, the roles and people inside the circle operating in those roles, they don't have any, they don't have any duty, um, any responsibility to, to heed the requests that come from the outside unless they come through the membrane. 
that has the effect of allowing people to um, kind of not get, not get uh, hijacked or to be able to prioritize their work more, you know, more holistically. So how does each circle know what to do? Um, connecting the circles are things called accountabilities, and roles also have accountabilities. Um, we also, each circle and role also has a purpose. So a role is defined by purpose and accountabilities, and accountabilities usually describe relationships between two roles. Sometimes these are called relationships, which is kind of fun. Um, we'll look at an example of, a, of an accountability in a little bit. Going back to the other half of this, uh, democracy, um, or ocracy, um, when you take the, so when you take this, this notion of govern, govern, governance, government or governance, um, when you take all of the accountabilities for a given role in the whole organization and all of the rules of what's called the holacracy constitution, which is basically a playbook, a, a set of rules that describe how to play the game of holacracy, the rules to, you know, for, how, for how authority is distributed and how decisions are made. Um, when you take this all together, you have governance. And there's a lot of it. Um, it's not the kind of thing that you want to try to learn, like read the, read the Constitution and learn holacracy. That's not a wise thing to do. Um, but if you do want to learn, like really learn this and kind of get your head around it in a real, real nice way, the holacracy book is amazing. Um, it's about a four and a half hour audio book. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's entertaining. Brian Robertson uh, does, the, um, does the narration. Um, this is a great way to actually learn more about this if what I'm saying is at all interesting to you. Highly encourage. But back to this diagram. Um, so the Holacracy Constitution, this big document, it's really there to refer to when there's a dispute or a question or you're not sure about something. Do I have the authority to add a metric in this meeting? Let's check the Constitution. Do I have the authority to spend $100 on that catering. That won't be in the Constitution, but that will be in the governance that's specific to the organization. Um, but it's a pretty heady set of rules, and it's getting easier and easier to read. Um, version 5 is coming out very soon, which I guess is only for the holacracy nerds, would so that really matter? Um, so let's take a quick look at a role. This is uh, the, the developer role. I used to energize this at Holacracy 1, and it has a purpose, satisfy the customer, with product vision, which is another role, as a proxy, through early and continuous delivery of truly valuable software. Um, and the purpose, the purpose of the purpose is to give the role and the role filler something to align around, to give them a vision to follow. Um, and that's also, as a role filler, I can also change that. So it's not like it's an edict that I have to, have to follow forever. I have the authority to change that in a governance meeting. Um, but these accountabilities are really where a lot of the structural component comes from in Holacracy. Um, so let's just read a couple of these. Implementing user stories, bug fixes, and chores. That sounds like something a developer does. Is it ever really written down that that's what they do? Um, what you'll find is that more and more, there's more and more detail as you go down, down the list here. Um, and often, if a dispute comes up, if there's a question of like, is it your role or my role to do that? Or, who has the authority to do that? It's, that, that will get encoded in the governance. Um, so it's not a situation where you end up saying like, oh yeah, I'll do that for you, I got it. And then you do it two or three times and now, oh, you're the guy who does the backups on Friday night or something. It's like, that doesn't happen. We put it into an accountability. If we need to, we split it up into a separate role so those can be filled separately. Um, and what this does is it, it, gives the, it gives what we call the separation of role and soul. No longer are you fused to your job. No longer are you your job. You have roles. You energize them. You take them on. You put them on and take them off like clothes. Um, at Holacracy One, I think I had about 13 roles uh, at one point in three or four different circles. Um, and there's some interesting stuff that gets into you know how you get assigned into roles and how your role constellation looks, whether it's healthy or not, and are you energizing your time right? Those are all fascinating questions that are kind of beyond the scope of tonight's talk. Um, but altogether, this is governance. Um, and on the one hand, it's like, okay, so, you, so, you're, so you're laying on like you know, 40 pages of documentation on me to do my job. 
And yes, yes we are. Yes it is. And this is it. There are no other expectations. You can do whatever you want to achieve your purpose and accountabilities as long as it doesn't break one of these rules. That's the golden rule of philocracy. Um, you can do anything in your power that you see fit to energize your role's uh, purpose or accountabilities as long as it doesn't break another rule. I use the word energize in there. I know that's weird. Um, I'll say it one more time, even just a little simpler. You can do anything in your power to make this stuff happen as long as it doesn't break one of these rules. It's an incredibly empowering environment to be in. Let's, let's hold on to that for, for questions afterwards. Cool. Um, so we talked a little bit about roles and circles. And I guess before we move on, I want to touch on something called structural roles or core roles. And this is another case of my slides being out of order. Core roles. Every circle has certain roles in it which um, perform the function of maintaining the integrity of the circle. Uh, there's a facilitator which runs meetings. And the facilitator's job is simply to adhere to the rules of the game. They're not there to listen to you. They're not there to make sure you feel good. They're there to make sure that the right person has the, is talking at the right time. And if the facilitator cuts you off when, you're, when you try to talk, you can be guaranteed that when it's your turn, they will defend that space just as much for you. It's a really incredibly respectful way to work. Um, and even the quietest voice gets heard in a holacracy meeting because the facilitator sees to it. It's not personal, it's just the rules. There's also a role called the circle lead. This is formerly known as the lead link in version four. In version five, it's called circle lead. This is the person that represents the interests of the circle overall and takes work from outside the circle and breaks it down into projects uh, inside the circle. They also do prioritization. So they say this is more important than that. Um, and they also do strategy, which is also a way of saying this is more important than that. Um, you can kind of think of a circle lead as a manager, but they don't have the same authority. Um, and they don't have the same levers to pull to, to, to enact the, um, the work of the circle. How are they different than a product owner in Scrum? Um, the question was, how are they different than a product owner in Scrum? They are similar. Yep. They hold, the, they hold the vision of the, of the entity, um, and they help break down the work. So in that way, that's another really good, really good similarity between Agile and Holacracy. Um, let's see, did I miss anything about circle leads or secretaries? There's also a secretary. Um, depending on how much of Holacracy you're doing, you can sometimes get away without one. No one's going to like that I said that. But, uh, Having a good, good secretary can make all the difference in meetings. Um, the secretary is there to record outputs and kind of look up governance. Often you'll be in a meeting and you'll say, well, whose, role, whose, whose accountability is it to do that? Well, I don't know. Let's check the governance. So the secretary is there to check the governance tool um, for, uh, you know, to look things up, to, to get answers to questions. They also have the, the unique um, duty and authority to interpret the Constitution in the event of a dispute, or really any governance. So if there's a question, if it's, how, wait, wait I, I interpret that to mean this, and you interpret it to mean that, you go to your secretary. They make the call, and that's it. Um, so some of these questions about, like, okay, so authority is distributed. Now how do we actually make, you know, make, it, make a lot of these decisions? Uh, secretaries have a, a, play a big part in that. And it's really nice to have a talented secretary. Uh, so back over to here, we talked about roles and circles. Now let's talk about tensions and projects. Um, this word tension, kind of jargony, yeah. Uh, what is a tension? It's a person's felt sense that there's a gap between the current reality and a potential future. And we use this word instead of challenge or issue or problem or you know topic because it, it really is a, it's a feeling. It's a, I, you know, I'm feeling like I feel this tension. And as you feel into it, you can identify it, get clear about it, articulate it, and then you can process it. Holacracy gives you the levers, the pathways, to process tensions. 
That's actually what this is all about, is tension processing. Um, so we use the word tension. It takes a while to get your kids to like kind of get used to it. After a while, it does fall through the background. I've tried using different words with clients. Tension really is the best word for it. Um, I don't know how else to articulate it. Uh, there's also this, uh, this notion of, of tensions as being something that are negative. In holacracy, attention is neutral. Uh, this is from the holacracy.org wiki. Although the word tension may have a negative connotation in common usage, Holacracy's use of the term is neutral. The tension itself is the raw felt sense of dissonance before we label it as positive or negative. Um, and this is just another example of how holacracy makes things less, less personal. Do you have an example of a positive tension? Uh, any opportunity for improvement. Let's talk, about the, let's talk about that more at the end. Cool. Um, so some people say, Tensions, that's a, that sounds like something bad, something we don't want. Well, what do you call a system that has no tension in it? Dead, exactly. Um, it's all about processing tensions, and that's what, that's what we're talking about doing here, is creating an, an, an organizational entity that can process its environment. Um, so tensions are what, what give rise to change. They're not bad. When people do weight training, they intentionally tension their bodies through progressive overload, and that's how they become stronger. In the same way, by processing tensions, the organization's work gets done, and the organization becomes more resilient. You found a problem with, with how the authority is set up. You have a tension. You process that tension. Now the rules have changed for the better, and they change and evolve over time. Um, there's no more giant reorgs every three years where the entire company gets turned upside down. This happens incrementally. Every week, every week you have a governance meeting and, you're, and you can change how the organization's structured. Um, and what this does is introduces, in a very real way, the concept of evolution into organizational structure. Now the, 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 the company itself is responding to its environment uh, in a very tangible way. Um, so one way to process tensions is by uh, making changes to governance, that's the roles and the circles and the accountabilities. And the other way, there's a bunch of ways, this is oversimplified, but the other way is by uh, requesting and taking projects. And that's what we'll talk about now. So what's a project? Let's see, did I miss anything? So a project is just an outcome, it's something to work towards. It can be big or small. It can take a day, it can take a year. As a role filler, you can energize it by, let's, let's get, pick attention here. Let's say um, there's not enough coffee at the meetings. Okay, well I'm in the role of coffee filler, so I gotta figure this out. I could go and make coffee and bring it to the meeting, or I could have a cafe built next door and ensure that the entire complex has coffee for the next 10 years. Depending on my resources, energy, you know, the needs of the, the situation, I can interpret a project in many different ways, as long as I get that tension, tension met. Um, in the context of Agile, you might think of this as a user story. A project is simply something, something that once, once done will move us towards an outcome. And there might, there might be a more nuanced way to put that or a different word for it. Maybe it's an epic, I don't know. But it's that kind of concept. Uh, it's, a, it's a unit of work. In Holacracy, each role maintains its own list of projects. It actually says in the Constitution, a partner filling a role shall explicitly capture and track in a database or a similar tangible form readily transmittable to reviewable and review or reviewable by another partner, all projects and next actions identified by such partner for such role and regularly review, update, maintain such database. Anyway, what this means is that everybody keeps a list of the stuff they're doing just like a backlog. So now, instead of having a single sprint backlog for the whole circle, each role maintains its own. Um, and you can still do project work where you have a backlog for the whole circle. Um, when I was doing development at Holacracy One, we had, we used Pivotal Tracker, we tracked our stuff in there, we estimated it, we did the whole thing, it's fine. And if I was interested in improving the backup system, I might take a project in my role as infrastructure. Um, or if the circle lead said, like, hey, how's our, how, what's our backup situation? 
and no one can answer it, he might, he or she, or they might create a role and give that role a project or request a, pro request a, a project of that role, rather, um, in, which to do, to, in which to get that work done. So we talked about a little bit about kind of projects as stories. And we also have this, this um, duty to regularly review and update and maintain the database. This sounds an awful lot like a sprint review. Um, so this weekly activity, generally it's weekly, of going through your projects and actions is pretty similar to like a, like a, like a sprint planning or a sprint review meeting. And I know some of you are probably cringing because I'm probably not using the right terminology and I'm okay with that. Um, but this is another similarity where now each role is maintaining a backlog. It has projects. It has to prioritize them. And um, it, it has to review them regularly. So you can see how we're taking a lot of the concepts from, from kind of Agile Scrum and using them in a more general context. And a lot of people, it seems like these days, are interested in taking Agile, and use, Agile, Agile concepts and using them in other parts of the organization. Holacracy does a lot of that already and has been doing it for a while. Um, so if you want to talk about that, I love that topic and I love doing that work. Um, excited to talk about that. There's also a thing called a tactical meeting. Why did I put this next to sprint planning? There's another practice that fulfills the purpose of sprint planning at the circle level, and that's the tactical meeting. Tactical meetings are one of my personal favorite parts of philocracy. I think there's something every organization should be doing. Um, and just because it's so valuable, I want to run through some of the pieces of tactical. So we're going to dive into what a tactical meeting is. And um, we're just going to start with the check-in round. This is similar to what we already did this morning. The purpose of the check-in round is to, for, for everybody to have a chance to get present, let go of their experience from earlier in the day, and, and really be at the meeting. And it's a great chance to just hear how people are doing and um, show up in your roles and as a person. Uh, I was talking to a client recently, and they were like, that's a waste of time to do those check-ins. But then he did one, and somebody was sharing that they were like really hungry and cranky. And after the meeting, he was like, God, I'm so glad that you know, I, I heard that, that, that Joe was cranky, because you know, I would have been really hard on him for this or that reason. Like, there is a lot of value in, um, in connecting with the human side of things. Holacracy is not purely a cold, dead, structural system. Um, and there's a place for it, and that's the place for it. During the check-in round, you have as much time as you want. The facilitator will defend it. One person at a time, no discussion, every time. Can you give, give an example for people who know each other already? Like we did, but like it was our role. Like we're working together daily. What are some of the things you ask or talk about? Sure, so the question was, if you're working together with someone or you know them well, um, what are your check-ins like? They can be really fast. Sometimes it's just, I'm good. Some people just say, checked in. Some people say, check. Um, some people say, man, I didn't sleep well last night, or I got it, my, my kids come, my kids coming home from, from school, I got to jump off Zoom in 10 minutes. Um, and sometimes, uh, there's, a, there's one meeting format that we have at Holacracy One called a partner meeting, which is a two hour meeting, it's called a partner meeting. It's a two hour meeting where the entire partnership gets together. This is not a Holacracy meeting, but we do a check in and we do a closing. Each one of those takes a half hour. We spend half the meeting for the less, but we spend a significant amount of the meeting just checking in and checking out. And it's really valuable for the partnership. Um, so that's check-in round. Then we do what's called checklists and metrics. And um, what I'm gonna do is hand around one of these cards so you can take a look at it. Look at it. This is the Holacracy uh, tactical meeting card. You can buy these on holacracy.org. And uh, it just summarizes the steps that we take during the tactical meeting. Um, if you're facilitating, you're, it's good, good practice to hold one of those so you have the steps right there and you can just adhere to the process. Checklist and metrics is a chance to get um, insight about the health of the circle. And typically, uh, the checklist items will just be a check or no check on a particular thing. Backups up to date, check or no check, check. Um, lunch ordered for weekly meeting, check or no check, no check. Okay, we gotta do that. Like this kind of thing. And um, these are on the circle. The circle holds these, and they're usually prescribed to roles. Metrics are numbers, um, just you know, website hits, sales last month, whatever it may be. 
and any role can add these metrics, checklist and metrics. Um, the lead link, or sorry, the circle lead uh, has, has the authority to take them away from the circle as a whole. Um, but it's just a good chance to kind of get up to date with, what, with kind of the health of the circle, get in touch with reality as it relates to the circle. Uh, project updates. Each person who holds a role in the circle maintains their list of projects. And this is where, instead of going into a long expository about how everything's going with the project, it's just what has changed since last time. And a lot of the times, it might just be no updates. You'll notice there's a tendency for the amount of work someone's made on a project to be inversely proportional to how much they talk about it. And this really cuts through that. It's just what, and if, the, if, the, if, uh, if someone starts going off about it, the facilitator will cut them off and say, hey, just what's different since last time? And if, this, if it's no updates, no problem. If it's no updates three weeks in a row, no problem, but maybe that raises attention for someone. So what we're doing here is we're just surfacing information and we're letting the roles in the circle process any tensions that come up. Um, it's not about being bad or wrong or not doing a good enough job or getting in trouble. It's just, did it happen or not? Okay, it didn't, then we need more resources? Maybe, who knows why? Um, and this is another case where separation of role and soul becomes important. Now maybe we need more role fillers in that role because that thing's not getting done. It's not Joe's fault, it's that there's not enough resources. Okay, let's process that. Uh, being able to separate these things is really where a lot of that clarity comes in. And then it's triage issues. This is the meat of the meeting. This is where um, we build an agenda, one item at a time, and I wish I had more material on this particular topic because I love it. Um, when you go into the triage issues, we start with a blank agenda. Anyone in the room can add items to the agenda and you process them one at a time. And you ask each, as, you, as a person shares their tension or their issue or whatever it is, they can process it through one of five ways. These are the things that you already do normally, but, but in Holacracy, they're modeled for you. You can share information. You can uh, ask for help or request information. You can request a project or action. And project and action are se separate ones, and we're not going to get into the, the distinction between project and action right now. Um, or you can try to set a new expectation, which is changing governance. Really, these are all the things that we do when we work together. We share, we ask questions, and if you do that fast enough, it kind of becomes a conversation. That's fine, there's, there's space for discussion in tactical meetings, and when you, when you first go into them, it might seem a little bit cut and dry, um, but the point here is that we're not gonna spend an hour talking about the same thing that we talked about last week. We're gonna share information, we're gonna ask a question, we're gonna move our projects forward, and I, as a facilitator, I'm gonna ask you, did you get what you need? and we're gonna stay on your topic until you did. And then we're gonna go on to the next one. One tension at a time, one at a time. It's just so wonderful the way it decouples issues. Um, you see this, I imagine you see this a lot in, in sprint planning where you've got, you know, you've got one story and like, well, if we do this and it ties in with that, but what about that subsystem and this and that? No, just, let's just take the smallest unit of work that we can define and solve that one thing at a time. Um, it's really about decoupling, which if you're a developer, you know that high, tightly coupled systems are pretty nasty to work with, right? Um, this is decoupling in the context of organizations and projects. And then the closing round. Um, the closing round has a neat, so it, usually people just share how they're doing or like, oh, that was a good meeting or, you know, it's fairly mundane and quick. But you can also share about the meeting. Like, I feel like that went pretty well during triage. I felt like it was a little slow. Um, and this is great feedback for the facilitator. And it's just great feedback for everyone so people are talking about how it went. You're not going to the water cooler and bitching about the last you know, 45 minutes of your life being wasted. You have a chance right there. And it's encouraged. Like the dissent is welcome. Um, and because you can lean on your roles, because you, know, you, you know your authority, you know what you have to do, you just don't have to be as nice. Like, you can just be more real. And that saves the being nice for the more human interactions. It's a very, it, it, it changes things in a very subtle way. So that's the closing round. Uh, sometimes it's their celebratory. Um, but having a meeting in this format where you've got check-in, uh, checklist and metrics, which is information about the health of the kind of circle, 
updates and then triage and then closing. It's, I just think it's the most elegant meeting format and I think everybody should be doing this. So, some thoughts. Um, Holacracy is designed as an integrated system and each part is there for a reason. To do real distributed, distributed authority and really transform how people work in your organization, you need to do the whole thing. If you pick and choose certain pieces, you're gonna leak authority all over the place. Doing Holacracy is hard, even for experienced organizations, but it's getting easier. Holacracy has been around for about 10 years compared to the management hierarchy's 1,000 years. Um, each year, the constitution gets simpler, more powerful, um, and just as in democracy, in which countries are governed by rule of law, and it's considered the state of the art in government, holacracy may one day become the state of the art in business management. It's the most evolved, humane way of working together that I've ever seen. And this isn't to diss management hierarchy um, and, and autocracy. Management hierarchy has gotten us tremendously far and built these buildings and those roads and created armies and nations and kingdoms, the best enterprises in the world are built on management hierarchy. And I think there's a better way. So what are some things you can do? Um, these are some exercises you can take home and, and, and do in your, in your work, just tomorrow if you'd like. You can start by writing down your roles and accountabilities. Um, and that's just to get clear on like, what am, what am I actually accountable for here? Or what am I not accountable for? When you actually start looking at it, you're gonna find that it's really fuzzy and you <coughs> don't know and the, you might start getting uncomfortable with that. Hopefully you will. Um, part of this is getting, getting real about the world around you and then being able to change it. Um, so you can write up your roles and accountabilities, compare them to your peers, notice where you interact um, and what you can count on others for. And there might even be some tensions hiding in there. Uh, I believe that every meeting should have a facilitator. If your meetings don't have a facilitator, just step in and do it, because no one else is. <laughs> um, give every meeting a facilitator and don't let it be the power holder. Um, the person who holds the most power should not be in charge of the meeting. There's a rule in Holacracy that the, um, the circle lead cannot, f cannot hold the facilitator role. They have to be separate. Um, so give your meeting facilitators, please. And build your agendas on the fly. Um, you don't need a long agenda going into a meeting. Everyone knows what their issues are. Just start with a blank piece of paper and just write down one thing at a time. Build your agenda, start going through it. Add new issues between each one. Um, it's a tremendous way to be really efficient in a meeting. And ask people, did you get what you need? And move on. Get clear about what's needed. And if you can, get clear about who has the authority to make the decision. Do we need to all sit here and talk about this? or? who has the authority to make the decision. Okay, you have the authority, what, what, do you, what do you need then? What do you need personally to make that decision? See how different that is than like, let's all figure this out? It really moves the, um, it moves the responsibility onto an individual in a really profound way. Um, so if you can, yeah, ask who has the authority. And um, the, uh, the card is also available online. Use the five pathways if you really want to be nerdy in your meetings and say, are you sharing information? Are you requesting a project? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's fun. Start and end every meeting with a check-in and a closing round. It might take up 10% of your time, maybe 15%. Um, at least do the check-in, the closing, you know, you can skip that, but man, People talk about like, oh, okay, it's time for stand up. Uh, what'd you do yesterday? What are you doing today? Anything in your way? And what's your favorite superhero? Who cares, right? Just like give me a chance to say how I'm doing. Um, we don't need to build in these little mechanisms to get more camaraderie and more togetherness if we just go around and ask everyone what's up every day. Um, and after a while, that tension will start, like people, people's tensions will fade and you'll get to know people. It's just really tremendous. So really just get clear that you are not your roles. Think about energizing your roles, not being them. A role is like clothing that you take on, take, take off and put on, um, and you have roles in the rest of your life. Maybe you're an athlete or a father. 
Um, you're a multifaceted human being, not a job description. Identify that the organization is separate from you and get clear about your own autonomy. Think about your role's purpose and the purpose of your organization and your own personal purpose. See if they align, and if not, think about what you're gonna do about it. Thanks. Yeah, that's it. So that was uh, almost an hour. Any questions? What's a, sure, so the, the question is kind of what's the healthy size of a circle? It's, it's, a, it's about that, yeah, it's about the same. Um, let me see if I can pull up some governance here and I can actually show you. All oh, right, we have two screens going now. Okay. I'm assuming these companies are deciding their bifurcation between the two groups. Yep, and that's actually a very interesting gov governance meeting. So you go into the meeting and someone says, yeah, I think we should create a subcircle. That's a long meeting. And there's a thing called IDM, integrated decision making. That process, uh, that's where you need a really good facilitator. Because in tactical, you're, you're working in the, in the company, you're doing the work of the company. In governance, you're working on the company. It's surgery. And you need a facilitator who's not gonna wreck things. If, now, if stuff gets in there, it's okay. If, if bad governance gets in, it's okay. The secretary can strike it, we can change it. Um, but those are the really interesting meetings where everyone's think, talking really slow and being really careful. Um, and when it's governed well, you still can, can just show up as yourself. I don't mean to suggest that they're really scary, but, uh, but boy, tensions can fly. Let's see. Um, any, other, any other questions while we're just sitting here? Oops. Yeah. Um, so is, is there thoughts on what to do when the role isn't a whole person role? Yeah, so how do you, uh, how do you manage um, when, when one person has a lot of roles or how do you work, how do you work with, a, with a bunch of roles? Very often there are roles that, that, are, that are, you know, an hour a, an hour a month, you know, um, scheduling the janitor, right? Someone's gotta do that, we need a role for it but it's just a tiny, tiny thing. Um, each person is also responsible for evaluating their role constellation. We call it the, uh, their role constellation, the, the set of their roles. Um, let's see here. And a good thing to do is to just ask people and look at people in your circle and see what they're like. If you feel like you're overloaded, you can go to your circle lead and say like, hey, look, I've got these roles and this is how I'm prioritizing them. Would you like me to prioritize it differently or can you find another role filler? Also, often what you'll see is that the way role allocation works is that the circle lead is responsible for assigning people into roles. But if I have a role and I think he'd be a good fit for it, I can say, okay, man, can you take this role? And if he says yes, we can just do it. Like you can, ch you can change the rules of blockers so you can amend them to allow you to be even more distributed where you don't have to have one person make those decisions. And the more mature an organization is, the more you'll see these sorts of rules distributed out. Hiring, firing, vacation policy stuff. Like, that gets more and more distributed. Um, there's a really fascinating rule. You can't um, add any accountabilities to the circle lead, but you can take them away, if that makes sense. So you can give someone less power. But you can get, like the big power holder, you can give them less power, but you can't give them more power. Uh, it's distributed into the into policies. Um, let me find an example here. Um, so we're going to look at the uh, governance of Holacracy One, which is the company the company that I used to work for. Um, this is their organizational structure. It's grown quite a bit. I think that when I joined, it was probably about half that size. Um, Let's see, here's the Glassvard circle. This is, this is where I used to hang out. And there's about 
five or maybe eight people in, in this circle, but look at how many roles there are. Each person's holding quite a few roles. This, um, let's see, the color difference is there's unfilled roles. Unfilled roles fall to the circle lead, kind of like a manager, the garbage collector. They pick up everything that's not done by anyone else. Um, incomplete roles are uh, invalid governance. The green ones are filled, and the bluish ones are uh, core roles. Facilitator, secretary, circle lead, rep link. Um, at one point, so to your question about what happens when you bifurcate a circle or how big do they get, at one point this was all one circle and somebody said, you know, all of these technical, technical, technical conversations that we're having in tacticals, the, the CS people don't care about that. We, we're wasting time by having non-technical and technical in the same tactical meeting. Someone proposed that we split the, split the circles. And we did that. Now we've got a circle that's basically all technical people. Um, I still, you know, I wasn't happy with that decision. Like, I was like, I don't know. I, I think we should all stay one big circle. I think it's better. Um, but I couldn't find a good reason why not to do it. I didn't have a strong enough objection. And there's criteria for what an objection is and what constitutes harm. The question is, will, will making this change cause harm or move us backwards? If the answer is yes, then you need to say why. If the answer is no, then you have no objection and the change will go through. Um, this is where we get into governance and some really, uh, really interesting topics. How does the organization as a whole maintain its purpose, the why and the narrative, and something that is? Great question. So in traditional organizations, you've got like kind of like a cheerleader and like a big purpose meeting maybe once a year or something, and every, some, someone sends a memo and that's your purpose. Um, in a holacracy powered organization, the the, the, the circle lead of the broadest circle, that's what we call the general company circle, circle lead, um, sets the purpose. Is that right? They set the purpose and then, um, oh no, they set the purpose in a governance meeting. So the, the, people in the, the people that represent roles in this broadest circle, presumably who have the most context for what the organization is doing overall, similar to like the C-suite, um, they, they set the purpose, and then everybody in the organization interprets that purpose and aligns around it. And each subsequent circle also has their own purpose, and each role has its own purpose. Um, so Holacracy One's purpose is to evolve humanity's relationship to power. Pretty broad purpose can be interpreted different ways. When you get into some of these um, more specific circles, Let's take a look at training. Training's purpose is transformative trainings that transmit holacracy and catalyze the, cap the capacities it requires. So you can see how this is, this is an interpretation of the broader purpose. Um, basically, they're, they're, they're set by one person. They're, they're set, purposes are set in a governance meeting. Strategies are set by the circle leads independently. And there's a meeting format for doing that. That's right. That's right. You said you said that the, the the broader circle doesn't direct the inside of a circle for how it interprets its purpose, and that's a really important thing to note. Everybody, every person, every role, every circle is responsible for interpreting their purpose and their accountabilities to the best of their ability. It means you have to trust people, which is something that starts happening. Um, yeah, so it's really hard for command and control, you know, there's just no space for it. Um, yeah. But there's still room for a consistent line of narrative for the entire thing. I was always worried that depending upon how that purpose was maintained, that the whole organization would start to kind of go in a random walk and to maintain a consistent direction. But with the direction change, it could be, they wouldn't be well that, there's a, there, that, that sounds like a tension. There's the potential for that. And if you sense that, there are ways that you can do something about it. Well, it's kind of the thing, the thing that jumped out at me the most was that the 
in my experience, the hardest thing about watching agile transitions is to change the power dynamic, right? Like anybody can pick something up online and read it and say, this is what we're going to do. And anybody can schedule meetings and call things change like you would do. Mm -hmm. But the power shift, the power shift is so painful. So as you're talking, I'm like, how do you get anybody in a hero culture of a C-suite level that loves to get it, like, how do you convince anybody to do this? So the word, you use the word hero, that's a dirty word in holacracy. Well, yeah. We don't like using I mean, it. Same with consensus. I guess my point is, no, no, uh, we're all there with you, but how right. do you get somebody at C-suite to go, sure, I'd love to give all this power away. Right. So you, so it really only works, it really works best, I should say, when the top power holder is invested in it. And the way you start doing this, usually, is the person at the top signs the Constitution. It's, it's a symbolic act. It's not a legal document. Um, but what they, say, what they do is they put a stick in the ground and they say, look, I want all of us to follow these rules and I'm not, uh, I'm not, be, I'm not above these rules either. So what's the value proposition for that person? They, uh, they don't have to make every decision in the entire organization. They're, a lot of, a lot of uh, leaders are overloaded. They don't have the information to make decisions. People are coming to them and asking them for, for decisions. Um, and, and are you finding that that value proposition is overriding the ultimate fear of loss of control? Um, the fear of loss of control is very real and it's chaotic and it's crazy for a while. Yeah. Um, okay. And I think that people who people who realize that they want that like they like you talk about servant leadership, it's more like just get out of the way. <laughs> like we don't like you're not necessary anymore. Yeah. You know, if when the when the structure, the structure, the constitution, the rules. It does all the stuff that the managers used to do. You don't, you don't need those functions. You can refer to a document to decide when to do things, how to do things. Right. So the manager is cool. Managers are really threatened by it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm actually pretty new to Agile, so if my question sounds naive, I'm um, excuse me. But so with respect to what you've actually implemented this, you, you mentioned working with AR. Yeah, so the question was like, what kind of companies implement Holacracy? Um, not a whole lot, there's not a whole lot of it in the Bay Area, and I actually find that small startups, okay. they, well, the, the thing about small startups is that they need to move too quickly to implement this. It's dangerous for them. Um, so the types of organizations we see it in are usually in the 20 to 50 to 500 range. Um, usually they're established businesses that know how to make their money. Um, and they're just they're looking they're looking to get better. They're they're already successful and they want to be more better. So here's my second question. So my background is in SAP and I've worked in like for example in the computer tech big environment, shared services, supporting supporting all of the businesses. I'm not doing software development or implementations of SAP. I'm just kind of wondering how I'm trying to put my head around how Holacracy would fit into an environment where we're we're rolling out. CRM or whatever, business intelligence across multiple business units, shared services model. You know, I don't know if that's. You'd still have all the same challenges you have now. It's not. I mean, it doesn't. It doesn't fix your problems, but it gives you ways to address your problems that you probably didn't have before. I, mean, I like the idea of check-in. I think that, that that makes a lot of sense. I'm just trying to put my head around some of the other stuff I get. But um, I'm so what? I, what I love about this about this work is that I've been doing it for four years and I'm still fascinated by it. And I still think about how does that work and there's still subtleties. So I love that you're on this, like you're, you're engaged and you're on the path. It's a great place to be. Jack. Yeah, so I, I'm actually one of the geeks who years ago read the Constitution and then I stopped there. But the Constitution I think is interesting to read. Maybe I'm one of the rare people who like read the fine print. But I remember being super excited about tension processes you highlighted that as the most impactful piece. So I guess my question is around the budgeting, the big budgeting concept. Um, you know, you look at the CFO or the, the corporate controller's office of an organization, right? Control, controlling the money in an organization, right? Baked into the, the name of the department. Mm -hmm. How have you seen that in implementations? Do you see it start out as we're adopting this and we're changing the way we, we fund projects 
right now, or do you see that slowly processed intentions change how the money flows yeah. to other organizations? So that's a great question. The question was, how do you, how do you see um, resources get allocated in like uh, in like a control like from like a controller or in like a money level? flowing right money money flowing how do you Broker deal with money flowing yeah. um, at first when you first implement it doesn't change it's the same thing the person somebody has an accountability called allocating money to departments and they have a domain called companies money um, <coughs> they have the authority to do and you can't go spend that money there's a domain on it we didn't talk about domains today but um, over time, you'll find that in a good organization, in a healthy organization, you'll start seeing policies that describe like, well, if, this, if the amount is under $200 and it's for a client with a net worth of over a thousand, like then it's okay, right? You'll start to see policies develop that open it up more. Um, another, another big thing that happens is that circle leads, people that are in charge of you know, big divisions, they have to go and ask for the money just like, just like normal. They have to pitch to the, pitch the controller and say like, hey, does it make sense to you in your role as controller to give me $2 million to roll out this project and have that conversation? But now you can have it in a very mature way, you, can, you know, very objective way. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think that's the, the thing that excites me the most about the tension processing is that it does provide, you, you have the clarity and then you have a mechanism to basically cut through the, the corporate politics that so many organizations are like, Yes. They're run by day in and day out. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds awesome. All the way in back. And, and the tension processing or your circle of leads, is that something that you can bring in a la carte? I mean, are there philocracy pieces you can a la carte in general? Right. Or is that something you advise people to stay away from? So that's a, that's a great question. So the question is, can you bring in tension processing a la carte? Can you kind of start to do some of this, or do you have to do the whole thing? Um, the Internal to Holacracy 1, the answer is no. You have to do the whole thing. You have to start all at once. So tomorrow, we're doing governance meetings. Um, and it's, that's the rip, rip off the band-aid approach. It's a big ask. And it causes huge amounts of chaos. Um, I, I think that you can start to do some of it. And I think that when you start doing some of this stuff, you notice that you need the, start needing the other pieces. And you might get a little disgruntled at your job because like, you start to see where the power is and how it could be better. Um, and that's really going back, to, going back to my personal purpose of freedom. Like that's really, once, once you start processing tensions in your life all the time, it, that, there's, a, there's a freedom that emerges from that. It seems like the correction of rules is what seems to represent the big complicated machine. And that the machine doesn't really So the question was, how do you get through the initial stages when everything's really chaotic? Right. Is that summarize your question? Um, when you do an implementation, the first thing you do is just model what's already happening. So let's just model all of our current roles and all the current authority distributions, and maybe there's a role called manager, and maybe it has an accountability telling subordinate what to do, and maybe the subordinate role has an accountability doing what manager says. Great, let's start there. Now you've actually recreated management hierarchy. Holacracy can model that, it's a meta framework. Um, and now that can start to evolve. And so now you can process tensions and change it. So basically you just, you just keep doing what you're doing but you, you've got this new layer and new levers on top. And, and it gets a little crazy because people do have more authority to do whatever they want. Yeah. In your opinion, what, what is Holacracy? Um, well, the ability to theoretically, yeah. 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 Uh, so holacracy is slow. Right. It's not as it's not as efficient because we have more meetings. Well, I shouldn't say that, and my colleagues are going to hate me for saying it. Um, it's actually extremely efficient when you're practicing it well. Um, in fact, I think it's probably a lot more efficient. Um, so I, I really shouldn't have said that. When you're first practicing, it can feel slow. Um, it's optimized for evolution. It's optimized to be able to change, in, change in its, its, to like respond to its environment. 
So you don't need a, a three-year reorg now to start making, I don't know, mobile games instead of spreadsheet software, right? Somebody in the organization down low can sense that and can get a little resource or something and start trying it out, and the organization can adapt much more dynamically. It's, it's about dynamic adaptation. But is this better a function than that each individual role in or has access to complete information that, that the roles are, are at the intersection of, of commerce or transactions or that, that the community? That's a really insightful, insightful comment. So you're, you're saying that isn't there an assumption that the roles have access to all the information? Right. That it's like an information, there's a word if, for it. If, if, if you claim that it's optimized to be more, more robust in terms of like, you know, making and, and transformizing, then I mean, that's, that's just well, the assumption that we're working with. That, that is, and if you're somebody in, an, in one of those organizations and that's important to you, it sounds like a tension for you to process. How are you gonna distribute information so it's all, so it's all fair? So, it, I mean, depending on the organization, it can be different. Um, but there is an assumption that people have access to information and um, that gets into like economic theory which there actually is quite a bit of in this it, um, and it's better than it is now like this only has to be better than it is now for people that don't have any ability to change their to change how they work or who they like to change anything about their environment this is a huge step up even with the same amount of information is it also safe to say I don't know this But I guess I feel like to your question, this makes sense to me because yeah, I, I really enjoy the 10 meetings a week that are sitting with the same people and the same discussions over and over and over again just because everybody doesn't always need an office worker, right? So um, tons of time wasted there. But even if you're not, one of the things I find is we're unwilling to take risks with the people that could make decisions and do have that information, so much so that the people that have the information may not even realize they have so we're not giving them the opportunity to step up. And, and so in something like this, I think when you say, we're looking at you for this, um, not only do you shut down some churn and some noise around it, that person gets some empowerment to go, okay, I think I know what to do. And even more than that, I see this so, so many people in the US, it's the subtle things I said, like, we're looking to you for this. That's you putting something on there. Does it make sense to you, according to your roles and accountabilities, to make this decision? Let's check. Yeah. Right. Now we can discuss it objectively. We can say, okay, so it says, well, it says here that you have, uh, that you're, you're supposed to design experiential trainings and workshops. Do you have what you need to do that? Can I help you with that? It's way different than like, hey, can you please make a decision about the workshops? Sure. It, it makes me think of the psychological safety concept instead of subjective psychological safety, where it's like on a plaque on the wall, it says we value and empower employees, but nobody <laughs> actually does, versus objective psychological safety, where it's like baked into the rules that that's you right. operate by. Yeah. I think that's so, it's so I don't know. I just yeah. love, I love the idea that that's just sprinkled on top of the entire thing. Yeah, yeah that's what we we'll always talk about um, uh, with existing hierarchy, power hierarchy. The power is bestowed upon not a real power, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's not what you want to work with. Here is true empowerment and it's baked into the actual structure. That's where real power comes from. If it's not something that is given to you or taken away at a moment's notice, but it's baked into right. the structure. And it's ex it's explicit. There is definitely a power structure here. It's not it's it, not everyone yeah, it's empowering through the structure as opposed to empowering yeah. because hey, I'm your boss and I'll tell you now you can't do that. So I'm gonna see if I can find an example. Um, and it looks like we've got only a few minutes left. Quick question. Uh, sure. When you think about value prop for a person that's in an organization, what's a value prop or burning platform for the organization that, like, who comes to you and say, hey, Jonathan, I think yeah. I can use this, and so this is why I feel so. What's this why? So I, I mean, I learned it as an individual contributor, and I loved it because I got autonomy. I mean, I, yeah. I decided that, I, decided that I, I thought we should have a mobile app. So I created a role in a meeting and I addressed, I addressed, uh, I addressed um, objections that people had and I got the role created and then I went to the lead link and I followed our process and I got funding and I went out and I hired some developers and now we have a mobile app. 
that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, there's another example of a distributed authority company where like some guy, some guy low down, it was in a, a company in India and they wanted to open like a nuclear power plant or something. And the guy up higher was like, no, that's a terrible idea. It's not gonna make any money. The guy was able to use the rules of the organization to do it, the, the, the lower down person. And it became wildly successful. Like this gives your company the ability to adapt to its surroundings in ways that you don't even know. Like people don't even know how much information they have. Uh, you know? I think this audience will live on both of that. So the problem with that is that you described an absolute spot on. So I'm more searching for this. Why I have, I have a company. Why is my company mean? How, well, how do you maybe it doesn't. If you maybe it's a bad idea. Real, as fast as the future is, the universe is moving ahead, you then you don't. So if you're a man who you can talk to, who thinks that you're, so you're smarter than the rest of the universe, you don't need it, right? So is change, so, so, so what I'm hearing is that it's like you need change, the pace of change, right? Accelerate right. the pace of change. And, and, yeah. and the company Perfect. automatically morphs. I get into. that, I get that. Is that the only thing then? Is there anything else? Maybe they could call, I mean, my gut reaction to that is I'd rather work under that. So yeah. then you might retain better yeah. talent. Oh, it's in the current world of playing people, it's just commodities. Who no cares about the nobody, nobody will buy GPT today. Right. Okay. Well, it seems to be more for expectations. Let me ask you a question. Do you have companies that are healthy, competitive, making good money, profitable, to decide out of the blue to do this? Yeah. What is their reason then? Why? It's it's probably that they they see a they see an opportunity. Um, for the organization to, to live beyond any one person's legacy, or any one person's vision or purpose, right? This, this the, the organization becomes an entity. The people energize it, but it has its own will. It has its own purpose. It moves through the world. It spends money. It builds buildings. Um, and it's not just like, you know, Steve Jobs thinks we should have we should all have phones, which is wonderful. I'm so glad he did that, but. The, the quality of creating these organizational entities that we energize, they're like, they're kind of like computer programs, but they're like businesses. So, so it's almost as if they want of what's in front of you. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people talk about like uh, Tony Shea from Zappos, he wants a company that'll live on past him, you know, for hundreds of years. How are you gonna build a company that's gonna be? Supposed evolution. Really yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be able to evolve depending on its environment for hundreds of years. Um, that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're talking about. It seems here. like it's rooted in making an impact and existing into the future. And then the side effects, same for the case of agility, in my opinion, happy customers, happy employees, right? Like valuable output for the world. But, you know, I think at the core, it's adaptability into the future. And the world's changing faster than it ever has been. Okay. You know, so the case for agility, the case for holacracy, I feel like they are so oh, yeah. tied. I almost, I almost see this as a framework for change, where you mix yeah. it with, right. with the agile transformation. Because you can start where you're at, and then use tension processing to continuously improve. So yeah. now, if you can apply it to what you just said, then yeah, it's all. Makes me want to go start a company just <laughs> like, yeah. just <laughs> experiment. Company that experiments with holacracy. That's our right. <laughs> I was going to say the reason I have so many questions about yeah. who's signing on to this and how do you get that adoption going is because I, I mean, I do see a lot of similarities with agile, but I think if you got the guy at the top, the lady at the top, to go, I'm in on agile, and I'm in in a way where I understand it all the way down, mm -hmm. I think agile would have a much better rate of adoption. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. so I, I mean, to be fair, I don't, I don't know that. I don't immediately sense this is doing something you couldn't get somewhere else. But I think you're smart if you're out of the gate about a lot of the success is about shifting that tech target. Yeah, yeah. Because that doesn't get talked about agile enough. Everybody goes, hey, I want to do this thing, and everybody's done it, right? So my company should do it, I guess. And yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's it's, the top. It's, it's the middle um, is the problem because there's not a place for somebody um, my age, micromanagers, that do more harm than good ever. There's no place for them. Neither Holacracy, Zappos, Jeff and I talked about uh, 
hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, and if, if they're not going to change in the last And I guess I see that as a, as a failure of leadership above that middle layer. Um, they, oh, so, it's so, the, so, so it's the leader's job to save the people in the middle from... No, it's the leader's job to make sure they understand how they can be valuable in transition. Yeah, and then you choose. And then and you choose, exactly. yes. Uh, it's pretty rough. I mean, any any effort can be sabotaged, right? It's an agile concept, right? I mean, you know, a, a lot of places, big organizations have had the rabble start agile, and it, it got going because the best people wanted to do the agile, so their projects worked, right? And you lose a lot of yeah. people along the way when you're doing like <coughs> I don't know if you personally have seen that try to. I've seen, I've seen, companies have started and then stopped. developer and um, became the director of DevOps when it was brand new for a very large consulting company. And he just did it for the DevOps like practice, use call after sequence and then that. And it worked really well for him for a number of years. Um, so they just just in that one practice that they do call after sequence, it works really well for them. Yeah. yeah, you can if you have a if you have a power holder that can kind of shield you from the rest of the yeah. organization, then it can work yeah. pretty well that way. Well, I can, I, can, I can generalize. So the question was like, what, like how, how does authority leak when the rules aren't integrated, when you're not doing all of it? It's kind of like, okay, so you're telling me that I have the authority to do this and I can, I'm in charge of my environment. Um, but at the same time, you're just gonna shut me down because you didn't like sign the constitution because we don't have a document we can look at together. Now granted, the authority holder can say, yeah, never mind, I'm throwing out the constitution even though I signed it. But when you have something explicit, um, you can refer to it, you can have a, an intelligent conversation about it, and you can get different opinions on it. When it's just one person's opinion over another, there's not that opportunity, and that's sort of where some of the authority can leak. Um, it's sort of like leaky abstractions in computer programming, like, oh, this is great, except that when you, do, <coughs> when you go to do this, it falls apart. I think we're at time. Um, I really, really enjoyed talking about this. Um, yeah, we're at, we're at seven. seven. We're out, so. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Please, uh, please drop me an email. I will, I will come to your company. I will talk about this stuff. I love it.